further on in your career, you've actually been told that you have like a uh, like a bad habit or something, and you've had to rectify that, <laughs> maybe in short order. Well, well, I, I had uh, for years and years and years, when I was playing the hi hat, I used to swivel my foot like this, until one night during a song, there was the most excruciating pain happened, and. My kneecap, and the, the kneecap uh, sort of runs on a rail track, and my kneecap flipped off. And it was the most agonizing thing I think I've ever had. And uh, I ended up, I was in the middle of a tour, and I ended up being taken to the Leeds Broncos rugby league team, oh, right. to their physiotherapist on a Sunday morning. to play for them. And he flipped the whole thing off, did acupuncture, and it was the most agony, agonizing thing ever. And then they strapped the whole thing back on. And I, I couldn't play the hi-hat for about five or six weeks. In the middle of this tour, I had to keep the whole thing closed and just right. play like this. But the thing about it is, it was a terribly bad habit that I had to completely rework the way that I was uh, using my uh, leg when I was playing the hi-hat. So, yes, these things can happen. It can happen in different guises, you know, it could be... Mm -hmm. Uh, a habit you've got in playing or something like that or something like this and then you suddenly you don't realize you're doing it until something happens and then you've got to go crikey I've got to sort this thing out you know pretty Ooh. pretty swiftish I had one I, of course I've got loads of bad habits like uh, most drummers have I, I think but they've actually become part of your technique uh, this is my excuse but one one of the things was when I joined the Kinks, I'd always, uh, we, Jeff and I talked this through. When he's with Johnny Alliday, Johnny Alliday is in front of him. So you can watch him very easily to see what he's doing. So, and most drummers, I think, left-handed or right-handed drummers, look towards the hi-hat because the hi-hat is the thing that, you're, that you play in most. So you're sort of looking in that direction. Therefore, if you've got any dots, your dots are over there. And if you've, and if you, if you've got a set list, that's over there as well. You're not going to put, anyway. So having joined the Kinks, I realized that Ray Davis was over here and he wasn't going to move. So I'm doing this, but not seeing him. So I had to actually change the bad habit, if it was, or the habit of looking over the hi-hat to, to get to see him. And of course he was, he's world famous for stopping the band halfway through and doing another song or going into a, a, something completely different. So you ha I had to be watching him like a hawk all the way through. And interestingly enough, that became the wonderful thing about the kinks that you didn't know what was coming next. And, and certainly the set list on the floor, which you hoped would be the set list, never was. And if you were lucky, <laughs> the first song was the first song. But if it started differently, he wouldn't tell you. He just, you know, there'd be the whole build up from the, the intro music and all that stuff. And then he would start. And you had to work out what the bloody song was. And, but that made it the most exciting thing. Mm. You, and I, when I joined the Kinks, I realized that it wasn't a drunken man's gig. You could not dare mm. be, you know, have even more. I used to have that much off the top of a bottle of Heineken before I went on. But, you know, the whole days of having a pint before would not have worked. So that's, that's another habit that I had to break. Because everybody likes to have a pint, don't they? Um, Except Mike. He likes what, water. a pint of water, and that also causes the same problems because you need a pee in the middle of the gig. But yeah, <laughs> beside the point, that probably is a bad habit now that you can't control. But um, yeah, I think I actually the opposite because I my, my main income is comes from teaching, and so I see a lot of students that come. Um, I think I quite like the fact of changing things up anyway. And you look at Steve Smith and Dave Weckel over the years; they've changed the grip that they mm. use. You know, the, the pivoting points have changed. And I think sometimes it comes because of um, necessity, i.e. Mm -hmm. maybe age. It sounds like some like old age pensioners show today. But anyway, um, sometimes it's a necessity. Um, sometimes it's just because you can. You, know, you can change it all up. Um, I, for example, a big thing that I get when I, I learned a long time ago with Kenny Clare was... Um, <clears throat> Students will come along and learn to play, and they play whatever they're playing. You go, well, have you thought about playing it left-handed? Well, no. I'm and it's not necessarily with Kenny. It wasn't that Kenny wanted me to play left-hand lead, as in I needed to go and gig like that, but it's a different way of thinking. Mm. So I actually think that bad habits are also a good thing because it makes you think again. It makes mm. you think outside the box. 
like I said, you are in situations sometimes where necessity, i.e. your yeah, knee yeah, yeah. or whatever it might be, um, that, um, you know, I changed, for example, the position of my bass drum probably 10 years ago because I decided if my feet are at an angle, why aren't my pedals at that angle? Why do I need the bass drum flat on out there? I'm not saying I'm mm. right. I'm just saying that's the way I look at it. I'm like that with my knees straight like that, it doesn't feel natural to me. So surely I've got my foot on a bass drum pedal that isn't natural. Where if we say 10 to 2, so that's when my, so I, ch I, mm -hmm. I am constantly doing things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kenny Aronoff does the one where he changed his tom-toms around because he wanted to change his sounds around. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, right. so yeah. it's that's, just, you know, that's nice. I love it. I think it's great. Take all your tom-toms away and see how long you can survive, you know. Little things like that, I think, is just healthy. I think playing left-handed is, that's a very interesting thing to do and everybody should try it. In the same way as what we did the other day with bass drum, snare drum, hi-hat and uh, crash cymbal or ride cymbal, whatever. Um, if you play left-handed ride, as in don't don't bop, boom boom, it's a completely mm -hmm. different feel, yeah. mm -hmm. and yeah. you're fine if you do it. You'll find you'll sound like a '60s drummer, because it, it's it's very difficult to keep it. That left hand's not used to the rigidity of no, what the right hand does, yeah. Yeah. and so you you set up a completely different <laughs> eddy. And I mean the other thing. Well, there's loads of things. Well, the dynamics are different, obviously, as mm. well, which is what mm. I think. Like you could you could play Beatles songs in the nicest possible way, mm. playing them left-handed. Yeah. The dynamics of that made a difference to the dynamics of that. Mm -hmm. Well, so, that's because Ringo was a. You know, he was left-handed. Do you? So if he he was left-handed on a right-handed <laughs> drum kit. Can I do this? So if, do if where want. where our right-handed lot where we would go. Right one two. That's how we would fill. Ringo would go, which is a completely different sound. Just hearing it there, it's a different yeah. sound. Mm. And that's the key to Ringo. I mean, it, it, it's he astonishing. He watches his show as well, so he will, you know, I'm hmm. sure he'll make up on that one. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's always ringing me. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I, made a, I made an album with Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> me and Ringo, it was very interesting. Okay. <laughs> Richie, uh, Richie to me. <laughs> <laughs> We're like that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to you now. Of course, my one's to Mike. Um, so <laughs> where did all of this kind of come from, from you know, the whole MikeDolbear.com? What, what got you into oh, the whole drum community and wanting to expand it? Complete and... accident and probably the biggest mistake I've ever made. <laughs> and probably most of what I've just said is honest as well. Um, it was an accident and if I know, it's 15 years the website's been going. If I knew now what I knew, no. Yeah, what right? you knew. Yeah, I know you where you're going. Knew then. Okay, I've never now. called it MikeDolber.com, honestly. Um, what would you call it? Drums.com or, or something like that, okay. Um, <clears throat> it started originally because I launched a book. I wrote a book, uh, Rhythm and Feels. Uh, I was offered. 7% publishing deals, which was about right for drum books, 7 to 10%. And I was like, let's take me three years to write this and I'm going to see pennies. So it was almost like, well, you know what? I'm just going to put it out myself. How do I get it out to the public? Um, I had a student at the time, um, Jerry, who had just finished doing websites. And he said, well, why don't I build a website? And we put the book through the website. Great. So that's, that's what we did. Um, but then between us, we were like, you know, I've always had this bug about um, UK drummers, as far as I'm concerned, not, certainly back then, not being represented in the media, in the drum media. And it used to really bug me. I grew up with, I mean, I, haven't know, I didn't know Jeff before I launched the website, but obviously I knew, I knew Bob and I knew Clem, Ralph Salmon, so I've grown up with Ralph. I've known Ralph for many years. Um, Ian Thomas, Neil Wilkinson, and they never ever got any mention. And it used to bug the hell out of me that these guys are, you know, without them sitting on here, but Clem, these guys are the, the Hal Blaines of the yeah, UK. Yeah, and absolutely, nobody, absolutely. and I'd go to America and people would go, ah, oh, and I, I, these the guys I mentioned, I've got no disrespect to them. I love these guys as well, but JR, I love JR. Robinson, and you'd go to a show and there would be like, you know, people wanting, hanging out with them and all this kind of stuff. And the UK guys got nothing. And these, you, we've got some great UK drummers. Mm -hmm. And my other issue is that the, what the UK music scene stood for in the 60s launched rock and roll or rock music yeah, in America. Yeah, yeah, Any of those yeah. American drummers, yeah. you ask them who their influences were, they were UK drummers. Yeah. So I used to put a blog out 
on my site. Um, just shouting my mouth off, to be totally honest with you. Um, I'm dyslexic, for start, and I'm badly dyslexic. So me trying to write stuff is a joke. I mean, not even, you know, the computer understands what I'm trying to say. Um, <laughs> but So we started, basically, and that's how it started. And it was became, people started liking it. Um, the book got picked up by um, Hudson Music, who changed the way that they did things and turned a company called Hudson Limited, which became a distribution company. So they took the book on and they distributed the book. And I did a lot better, or I am doing a lot better than 7%. And the website started going as well. After about four years, I was paying for everything on that website. Um, and me championing the British drum scene and all that kind of stuff started sort of Dividends. Being on my, but it started being on my shoulders mm. a little bit. It's like, and I'm always, I love, I'm always for the small guy because that's what drummers are. We're the little guy in the business. So I'm always the for back. that. We're the, we're the ones at the back, yeah. and I'm for that. The little drum companies, the little drummer. So anyway, we we, and I'm not, I'm not saying any of this to be like, wow, look at me. I'm just telling you why. Um, after about four or five years, somebody offered me a, a reasonable amount of money for the website, and I was like what the hell are you seeing that I'm not seeing? Because yeah. I have no, it's costing me a fortune to run this site. Um, I've got people working for me. I've got people coming in and everything I did, all the trips to LA, it was all coming out of what I class as my family money. Um, so I went and set, met somebody who worked for, um, he set up the company Zoo.com. It was a travel agency mm -hmm. at the time. Young, young kid, um, it was a friend of a friend. I said, I need to understand why someone's seeing any value in this site because I need to understand what's going on. Anyway, I went to see him and he, I went in a sack. He had this really plush office in town. He was like, I don't know, but he still had his nappies on. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> he's just sold his first company for like two million pounds. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so, and he offered me cash there and then. He said, I'll, get, I'll match that offer. We go to the bank. I said, right, I don't want your money. Because I looked at it and I thought, right, if I sell it now, if my wife's watching this, I'm in serious trouble. Yeah. This is a bit like you know turning yeah. down the who or something, isn't it? You know, <laughs> now it's, you look back and go, I should have done it. Yeah. But, I, but I thought by the time I sold it and I split the money up between you know people that have helped me over the years and you know paid my taxes, it wasn't worth it. So I said to him, what are you seeing in the website? And he said, it's database. Yeah. That's why people are buying websites. And he said, have you thought about advertising? I was like, no, how does that work? I was like, what's happening here? I know at the time Johnny D or John DeChristopher at Zildjian um, we were always great, um, really into the site, supported the site, and, and Vic Firth, who was a huge mm -hmm. friend to me um, through all of this, they'd asked about advertising, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't what would you do without? I don't know how it works. So I did, I found out about it, which is exactly coming back to one of your questions here. You know, you learn. I never, I never, I, I was at 15, 16 years old. I was going to be in the next <coughs> biggest band in the world, mm -hmm. and I was going to be on the front cover of the magazines. That's what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But you know what? Shit don't happen. You know. It, but and so I learned about that, and I was still playing. I was still teaching. I built a reputation up as a teacher. At that stage, I just finished 10 years at the Talk of London, and um, the site just grew. And I came to another stage about six or seven years after the site started. And what? Um, and I, I, I was going to change. We were looking at changing the name of the website because it was becoming difficult. Because it's it's really difficult having your name over the top of the site because everything comes back to you. Everything, mm. anything bad that's written on the form, even though you've got nothing to do with it. It's you. Mm -hmm. You're the one. Yeah. I had people come up to me going, oh, you said this and you said that. I was like, I, I didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah. It's a forum. Yeah, but you put it up there. No, I don't put it up there. It's a yeah, forum. Yeah. It's a discussion. <laughs> you know, so, and it was becoming really difficult to maintain. So I was looking at changing the name and I sat with Vic Firth and I remember clearly, and as I said, I, I mean, I, that was my biggest miss in the industry was Vic. I, as anyone knows me closely, mm -hmm. know that I had a lot of time for Vic, and Vic mm -hmm. was really, really good, good to me. Um, and I remember he, he picked me up at Boston Airport, and we were driving up to um, his factory. And I said to Vic, um, "I'm thinking of changing the name of the website. I'm not going to tell you exactly what he said because uh, it's not repeatable." <laughs> he would have had the F but word basically, it, yeah. he said, "You'll be absolutely mad 
he said, I'm Vic Firth. Mm. I've been in the, uh, the Boston Symphony Orchestra for 50 years. He's played on 2,000 records. And ha most people didn't even know that part about his career. They yeah. just knew him as Vic Firth as Drumsticks. And he said, if you lose, if you give away that name, then you can forget it. And it, it stuck with me. Mm. But it also, as Vic said to me then, but you also have to protect it. It's your name. Um, and everything else has just come off of that. So 15 years down the road, everything that you know, I've done from that. But all of it has always been, hand on heart, has always been because I think it's right in the industry. And I think the industry, without going too um, deep, I think the industry needs a lot of, a lot of help. It needs support. support. It needs mm. support. Mm. It needs mm. sorting out. Yeah. Um, because we're getting caught up in a corporate world and we've got to remember this isn't about corporate world. This isn't no. about a hobby. We play the drums because we love playing the drums mm. and we've slightly lost that. We're losing it. This is why this is why we play the drums, yeah. you know. Yeah. So everything else that I've done about it is purely because of that. Unfortunately, I'm not motivated by money. I wish I was because I'd be probably uh, a lot better off. Um, it's always been about that. But it's been 15 years. Everyone's doing a website now. When I started, no one was doing a website. I remember walking around the NAM show one year and trying to tell people about I mean, The first year I went to NAM show, which would have been 13 years ago, I, sorry, the NAM show is a big music show in LA, big mm -hmm. trade show. <coughs> I couldn't get arrested. I mean, I, you know, I'd go, oh, I've got this website, a what? A website, uh, what's a website? Yeah. You know, or they'd all got caught in hey, the man. 80s. Mm -hmm. Oh, what, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Go away. And now the website's bigger in, in the US than it is here. My profile is bigger in the US than it is here. People actually, some people don't even know there is a Mike Dolbear. They think I've just named a website. Right, <laughs> <Mike Dolbert. laughs> yeah, yeah. Or they think my, it's that picture of me on the, on the logo is me. Um, well, isn't that's it? an amazing like yeah, so you can see, it looks nothing like me. I'm looking for Mike. He's over there. Yeah, yeah. No, no, Mike. <laughs> yeah, he's over there. Anyway. Um, the guy with the spiky hair. Yeah. <laughs> and the website currently gets, uh, I think we're about 600,000 people a month. 100 wow. countries around the world. Um, there's 85,000 pages on my website now. Um, and obviously all the other things I've done, Young John of the Year. Um, but I do get tired of it, to be totally honest with you as well, because it's, it's really, really difficult to maintain that because you're like, well, it's where on. do you go now? It's mm, yeah, What's next? Yeah. And I t this is a part-time gig. I mean, I'm, I'm a full-time teacher. Um, and so it is a part-time gig. Uh, these shows, although bizarrely enough, I'm guest instead of mm. hosting it, but you're doing a very good job, Jill. Um, again, it's just That's something good, I thought it? would be, it's fun. You know, mm. we're losing the fun in the drum industry. We've got to get more people ah. playing the drums. I mean, you, I think, were one of the Olympic drummers, okay? See, that's exactly what it's about. You know, Danny Boyle had this vision of, I know what, let's get a thousand drummers to play at the Olympic Open Center. It's like, yes, what? What a dream. I mean, 40% of those people had never played, including Jill, had never played the drums before. Okay, that, and that, it's probably why I do it. So, and I should so imagine yeah. that was, well, it's probably one of the most incredible memories. That oh, it was amazing. It was absolutely phenomenal. And it, it happened through drums. It yeah. happened through drums. And it happened through Daddy Boyle. I mean, look, that, no one, let's not beat about the okay, bush. Yeah, he, yeah. Was, he was the guy that said, oh, the visionary that, that, in it. Yeah. we all know what drums can do and how it makes you feel good. And it makes you feel, he was the one that sort of went, I want a thousand drummers. He didn't know what he wanted to do with them or how it was going to sound. <laughs> but he was like, I, I, I know those dynamics. And I, I remember, I mean, I get the piss taken out of me a big time on this show from people talking about it because they, you know, it's something I am very proud about being involved, but because of the amount of drummers. But I remember doing a speech on the night of the gig and I said to people, you know, because there's people there that had never, ever done a gig before. Wow. And I'm like, listen, this is it. In the deep end. It's only going to go yeah. one way <laughs> from tonight because yeah. this is the peak, you know, this is your first ever gig. And I can't remember. It was the this biggest. This is why I retired order. with drumming after that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. Just stop yeah. now because that's it. Because you want to climb Everest. That's yeah, the there point, you go. <laughs> so, um, so, well, so I have a question for you then: Is when do you know it's the right time to walk away? Oh. You know, you look at Vic Firth when it came to a point where he decided to. Vic never lost his passion. No. Vic. Um, but to hand, or how about how Vic to was hand in a different situation because. Um, if anyone, I mean, we were fortunate, all of us, 
to spend time with Vic, and anyone that's been mm. on any of these UDEs know that Vic used mm. to come along. Yeah. I never, I, Vic always would just make his own way over here, you know, and he was an older gentleman at that stage. He suffered really badly from his back. I ne he always, whatever I did would come. I mean, I'm sure, I think, you remember Vic coming to our UDE, you know, turn, yeah. up, turn up for a lesson and there's Vic first sitting there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he, and I think probably because of Vic, it makes me go, and, and people like Bob, all joking aside, I know we take the mickey out of him, but you know. Who does? Um, only me, so. <laughs> but Vic never lost that, did he? No, he didn't. I mean, he was, and he was such, was when you gentleman. spent time with yeah. him, he was so passionate. He was probably the most famous drummer I've ever known in Ooh. America. There was queues of people, wasn't there? Mm. Asking for signatures and a photo of Vic Firth. You know, I used to go and get him to go, yeah. come on, let's, let's go for lunch just to save him. I mean, it didn't matter. You would have, I don't know, Chad Smith over there and Vic Firth over there and there was a queue longer. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, I don't, it's a good question, Jill, because I don't feel that I've got, um, I think I'm probably at a stage with the website where I'm, I'm like, you know what? Everyone's doing it now. What's next? Um, I, I like challenges. Again, going back to that, the Olympics, it was a challenge that I was like, I, this, that's what mo motivates me. Um, I did, when I did the Champions League, it was the same principle. I've actually got something that's been presented to me at the moment, which I'm seriously considering, which will involve 10,000 drummers. Okay. Um, it's a start, isn't it? Well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's in... Let me check my diary. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a very strange part of the world. But anyway, but and I love that. I love that challenge. So I do thrive for the challenge. I'm probably getting bored with the website, if I'm being honest. I've got a really good team. Okay. Um, that's why the drum clips took off. That's probably why we're, we're doing these shows. Um, I need, you know, and I guess that's the same as drummers, isn't it? You do. If you're in the same... I would imagine Charlie Watts is going... Oh, God, I've got to play Brown Sugar again. Christ. I mean, I don't know. They must. must there they? has to be, yeah. I yeah. mean, and I, and I think we all like that. We don't, we don't play the drums because of, um, uh, you know, really, we don't play the If you want to make money from the music, uh, from, if you want to make money, don't go into the music business. Be an accountant or something because, you know, but yeah, it's, uh, it's think, so know, much fun. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't get into playing music because, oh, I'm going to be on the front cover of a little magazine or something like that. You get into playing music because you love it. Yeah. You know? And, and if you think about it, it's the yeah, 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 that's right. she married the right woman. woman exactly. <laughs> yeah. You've got a house for the rest of your life. <laughs> uh, can I answer that? Or, or is it just for no, my... No, no, you can answer that. Okay. Um, I began playing when I was, like Jeff, 10 years old. And so I've been playing for 62 years, which is... A lifetime. Hopefully, it's not a complete lifetime. It's like that joke, isn't it? How long have you been? Have you been playing all your life? <laughs> not yet. Anyway, um, I, so I have discovered that I d haven't lost the enthusiasm for drumming, and you know, I'll go on the road with who, more or less with whoever calls me, and the phone will ring, and I'll do it. And in a way, that is um, that is the problem. I'm not too old to play the drums, but I can assure you. There are nights when I'm too old to carry the bleeding things, you know, mm -hmm. because it's, you know, drums are not small enough, you know, they, I had a... <laughs> you designed I'd, one that was pretty good. I did have the one. The trap was pretty good. The I used to trap was that about in one yeah. case. That was <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded crap, but it was... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say any of that, but it, I mean, it was what it was, and it was a drum kit. You better cut that bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might get a, a... No, that's fine. <laughs> but uh, so I'm not too old to play the drums and I'm not too old to learn and I'm not too old to enjoy it. That's it in a nutshell. And over to you. I Jeffrey. haven't even thought about it yet. So I don't know. I, I can't. Uh, I can't. Uh, it's not even a, a, a question of even it's even entered my head. Well, moment. you're probably booked till uh, 2025 or uh, something like know, that. Something like that. Do you know yeah. one of the things that <laughs> I made a career change purposely? Um, whatever it was, 20 years ago, when I came out of uh, the West End and sort of fell into the teaching, um, I just didn't want to be on the road anymore for various reasons. Um, we'd had our first kid and I sort of felt I wanted to be there, okay? Um, I've been really, really fortunate with the website that I've got to know a lot of mm. drummers and I've become friends with them, not for any other reason that, you know, there's good and bad in every, every profession and a lot of them. I've got really, really good friends. And I must say, and I'm sure this is, both of these guys will tell, the one thing that 
all my f drumming friends, and we're talking about all the big guys out there, say is the hardest thing about it is although it's a great career, they love it, they're out on tour, you see all the f fabulous, yeah. they're away from their families, mm -hmm. yeah. they're traveling, and yep. every job has got a bad, you know, a bad part about yeah. it. Yeah. And that yeah. is the bad part for a lot of these guys. I mean, now I know it's easier because you've got FaceTime and you've got Skype. I mean, you know, when I was out there, I was, couldn't find a pa phone box. You couldn't even find a phone box. And yeah, I couldn't afford yeah. it if I did yeah, find yeah. it. But that, you know, it's, yeah. so I think that probably makes a lot of people go, okay, you know what? I, that's enough. I've had enough now. Mm. Um, because it's tough. You speak to these guys and they're like, they're away from their families for so long. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah, but and you think it's good yeah. living in hotels, etc., etc. But trust me, you... you know, it's, 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 it's like being in prison. If you could prison. morph yourself well, back to your own bed every night, yeah, yeah. Well, touring you, would be... To be honest, you can't, even, you can't even get involved in this because you just fly around in bloody... You know, <laughs> Don't you start dance. again <laughs> and stay in, in top-class <laughs> hotels. But the, everyone else... <laughs> I did my time. I did my time. Do you still have to show your passport? Oh, no. You don't even yes, have to show your passport. <laughs> do you still have to I don't even have one. He's got to someone to show it. He's got someone to show it for him. Uh, it depends who I'm working with. Yeah. So no, of course I have to go through customs. Okay, I'm just checking. <laughs> do you have to stand in the queue like everyone else? Or oh, no, no, no. Don't do that. No. So what happens if you go on holiday? <laughs> I don't go on holiday. You know, <laughs> he, he needs a tour manager. I know I'm on holiday when I'm on tour, for God's sake. <laughs> you are, yeah. You are, yes. Check his Facebook page out. Anyway, I know, so anyway go there. We're, sorry, Jill. We're going to end it there. Is uh, that it? No. Yeah, that's it, that's it. I'm sorry. We're just getting started. <laughs> oh, gosh. So um, I'd like to thank the three of you very much for you, being guys. a part of this well tonight. Well done, Jill. You can oh, have my job. Time. Shave your hair. Yeah, yeah I'm not Get shaving my hair. Um, thank you so much guys for being here tonight. Uh, thank you to the Bull Theatre for having us. Uh, thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy it and we'll see you next time, whenever that Ooh. is, Mike. <laughs> <laughs>